you, uh, if you don't have a Bible, there's plenty of them around. Uh, they're orange, they're yellow, and uh, you can go ahead and grab one of those. We're going to study the Bible, and uh, we're going to study a lot of it. And uh, we're going to feed you with God's Word, and I hope that you walk out of here like a stuffed pig. Uh, but let me encourage you, don't let us teach you more than you can, uh, than you can do. Don't, don't, don't let us teach you beyond your obedience. So, like, whatever you've heard thus far, let's get to work on that before you get to work on this. You know what I'm saying? So here's some new stuff tonight. But let's, I just want to encourage you to go back and, and start doing the things that you already know. Um, last week we started a series leading into Easter. Of course, Easter being the sign of new life. Jesus comes to life. We come popping out of the grave, which is c- totally crazy. Um, but we talked about our new life. and We talked about the fact that he came, that we would have life. We'd have life abundantly. That would be a good life. And so we start talking about some things that need to die before we can have new life. Things need to die. So we started our series, Put It to Death. And last week, we talked about some of the fake Jesus that are out there. That if we're going to um, accept a new life, we're going to have a new life in Christ, that we need to know what the real, who the real Jesus is. Because if you put your faith in something that's not real, it won't deliver, right? So we want to know what the real Jesus is. So last week, we put, together, we put to death a couple things. We put to death uh, this one of many choices Jesus. You know, Jesus with a, a small j. You know, not, not the real Jesus, that maybe he's just one way out of a, a variety of different ways to get to God. And what, is, what does Jesus say about that? He said he's the way. He's the only way. So we put that to death. We also put to death the fact that, 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 that Jesus was a created being because the scriptures tell us clearly that Christ created everything. It was, everything was created by him and for him. So he's, he's not the created Jesus. We put the created Jesus with a small j. We put that to death as well. And we put to death this idea, this is the funny one for me, this, this good moral teacher Jesus that somehow he's a, the people that don't believe in him as God, they believe that he's a good moral teacher. Well, how can he be a good moral teacher if he's lying about who he is, then his morals are right out the window, right? So you can't just call him a, a good moral Jesus with a small J. So we put that Jesus to death. And then, of course, everybody's favorite, this guy here, Rambo Jesus. This was the Jesus that was supposed to come as this mighty king warrior guy that was going to take Rome by force and set the captives free by sword. Well, we realize that Jesus is a king. And he does have a kingdom, but it's not of this world. It's eternal. And if it was of this world, he said, I'd have come and kicked all your butts, but I'm not because it's not of this world. It's eternal. Okay, so he is a king. He's not warrior king Jesus. We put that to death as well. So tonight we're going to put something else to death so that we can have this abundant life. Uh, the, the scriptures tell us that um, not only we, did Jesus come to give us an abundant life, an abundant new life, but it also says that, you know, that's like the effect. That's what's going to happen. But the cause of that, the, the way that's going to happen is found in Romans 8.29, which is that he's going to make us more and more like his son. See, for us to have an abundant life, we have to have a life that's much, much different than the one we already had. And so his desire is not for us to be like a better Shaniqua. It's not to be a better Kelly. It's not to be a a more buffed Jared. It's not to be a smarter Ken. Not that you could be more buffed. I get it. It's not to be a better of what you already are. It's that when you're in Christ, the old person is dead. And behold, there's a new man. There's a whole new person. And that person, ultimately the goal is this. Paul said it. I no longer even live. I do not live, but Christ lives in me. So what I'm saying is that when, when, when you walk down the street, and when I walk down the street, my goal and, and, and your goal should be like when people see you, they should see a dude in a robe with long hair and sandals, if that's what he looked like, which I don't think. But when they see you, they should see Jesus. That's the goal. Right now, just, I'm so thirsty because I have like really bad allergies like really bad. Last night during one fire, I'm back there trying to do this video camera and I'm just snorting and sneezing and crazy. And I knew I was really struggling. So I was going to take Benadryl before I got here, but I didn't want to end up in Lake Eustis on the way home. So I, so I held off. I held off. Uh, but today what I've done is I went, I went until I got home, then I took it, and then I crashed out in the, in the, in the recliner, which is better than a lake. Uh, but I, I knew I didn't want to start in again tonight, so what I've done is, what you see here is, is a battle between Benadryl and coffee right now, right here. And so I don't know who's going to win, but I'm like from Massachusetts, so I'm wicked dry. I'm wicked dry right now. It's working. I'm just hoping that if, like, if I fall over, you'll know why. Like, you don't need to call the ambulance. It's just that I, I'm Benadryl. So I did drink some coffee, which I haven't been doing much, but 
I did it because I'm trying to stay awake. So I don't know who's going to win. But anyway, um, I don't even know what I was saying. But we're supposed to be a different person, right? That's what I, I think that's where I was. So he came to, to give new life, new abundant life. And the way he's going to give us an abundant life is not to Im- a new and improved version of, of who you already are. It's to make you into a completely new person. That's his goal, to be totally like him. Okay, and, and so let me just put my cards out on the table for you guys, okay? You're, you're my family. Like, I love you guys. I, I love, Jerome, I love you, man. You don't think I love you? No. no? Tell me why. <laughs> no, man. He is a servant. That's what, it, come on, give it up for Jerome. He's a servant. No one twisted his arm. He gets it. He gets it. Every time I ask for something around here, him and Michael, yes, 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 all the time. So, again, I've totally lost my train of thought. It's awesome. Um, oh, so what I'm saying is I, I want to just let you know that, that my heart is, is this, is that I, I just want you, like if you're not, a, I, I, some people I don't even know here, like, sure, I, I don't even know if you're a Christian. But I make no bones about it. Like, I'm not hiding anything. I want you to become a Christian. I want you to become a Christian. And for everybody that's in here, from Roger all over to Daisy, I want you all to not only be Christians, but I want you to absolutely love Jesus. Like, that's what I want for you. That's the reason for this church's existence. That's the only reason why I'm doing what I'm doing, is that you would know and love Jesus for a lifetime. That's, that's it. And so, um, in order to do that, um, I, 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 although tempted sometimes to, to tell you all this he- happy, cheery things about God is good and it's all going to be fine and, 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 you know, all that with a little pretty smile, which I don't have, but, but, but sometimes because of my love for you that I have to say things that are serious and, and they hurt and they hit and they dig and, and you know why? Because of that song we heard earlier about he won't relent. Like he's relentlessly pursuing an inner healing. He's, he's relentlessly pursuing the heart of every person, not only in this room, but every person in our city and every person in the world. That's what he's pursuing. And the only way that he can get there is if he discloses his entire self to you so you can understand who he really is. And so I have to tell you the truth. I have to tell you the truth, okay? So the truth of this is, is that if you want to enjoy this abundant life that Jesus said he came to deliver you, you got to die. You have to die. Do you understand? And and for those who who, uh, don't understand, like, don't take that literally. Don't kill yourself. That's not what I'm saying, okay? But you... The, the, the immaterial who you are has to die. Like, if you're going to become a new creation and you're going to become like Jesus, it's not, like I said, a, a, an improved art. It's art dies. He no longer lives, but Christ lives in him. And so when they see him, like I said, they would see Jesus. They don't see art anymore. That's, that's the, the, the stone-cold truth is that you got to die. So you were born with a sin nature, and that sin nature opposes God at, in every front. And so you have to die to yourself. And, 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 and the guys in our Tuesday night group, we've been talking about this a lot. And, and, and you got to die. You have to, you have to come to the end of yourself so that you can truly live. You got to get rid of all the, I got to get rid of all the Moses that rebelled against God for 30 years. I got to get, and it's still in me, and I got to get rid of it. I wish it was as easy, and some people might tell you it's really easy to just come to the altar, bend the knee, and boom, everything changed. Like everything changed in some, in some areas, like your, your destiny has changed, like you're no longer going to hell. That's good, but, but the process of changing is continuous, and I have to continually try to uproot all the junk that's in me that rebels against God and hinders the abundant life that he wants for me. And so I have to die. I have to become more like him. I have to die. So I'm going to go through some things that really need to die. You guys want to kill some stuff with me? Who want, you guys want to kill some stuff, right? Put your guns away. Dan, where's the crossbow? Easy. 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 Yeah. 
All right, so let's kill some stuff. Here's the first thing. You know, Jesus said he came to fulfill the law. And so some people still fighting, 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 tooth and nail in the flesh, trying to keep all of God's rules. God's rules are holy and they're good and they're spiritual and they're great. There's 10 big ones and there's 600 and I think 13 littler ones, but there's a lot of them. And so when Jesus came, he put an end to that. And so Paul tells us something here in Galatians 2.19. I want you to go and I want you to read some of these things with me. I don't want you to just assume that I'm telling you the truth. I used to sell cars for a living. You can't believe everything I say. Still trying to purge that out. I purged out all the money. I know that. Jeez. <laughs> it's a process, isn't it? It's a process. Thank you, brother, for reminding me. So Galatians 2.19 Let's read that. You guys kind of there? This is what it says. He wants you to be free so you can live this abundant life. Listen to what it says. This is Paul. He says, For when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. So trying desperately to keep all these laws, it's not going to work out well for you. I'm just going to tell you that right now. Because as you guys all have agreed in the past, Paul is like super holy uh, Jesus guy, definitely going to heaven, right? He's trying to do it, and it's not working. It's, hey, what's up, man? Hey, so, so come on in and make yourself homely. Get it? Oh, that was a good one. That was a good one. You guys are terrible. You don't appreciate good humor. Okay, for when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. So I died to the law. So we're killing some stuff. I stopped trying to meet all the requirements so that I might live for God. So what's that telling you? It's telling me, I don't know if it's telling you this, but it's telling me that if I continue my life trying to keep these, these laws, trying to live up to these requirements, I cannot live for God. They're kind of like polar opposites. I cannot live for God if I'm just trying to meet all these requirements. I did this so that I might live for God. Look here at verse 20. My old self has been crucified with Christ it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Now, you guys all agreed that Paul is this super Christian, definitely going to glory guy, and he himself said that I'm no longer doing this because I want to live for God. So living to meet the requirements of law is not, does not ever equate to living for God. They don't go hand in hand. They don't go hand in hand at all, at all. And listen, this needs to be on our lips. This one here, I'm going to share a lot of verses with you tonight. But this one, this needs to be on our lips. Because if we have been freed to not have to live up to the requirements of this law, how is it that a church could ever come up with laws? And so it needs to be on our tongues and on our lips all the time that we have been freed. There you go, brother. We have been, we have been freed from the requirements. That's this, this exhausting attempt to try to continually do everything that it says so that God will love us, so God will appreciate us, so God can finally get us in. It's never going to work. And so we need to be on guard. Two things, it should be on our lips so we can tell people that, so they can understand. Because a lot of people don't go to church, and many of you in this room probably felt like that point, at, at that point, um, you felt like that at one point, that you felt like you couldn't go to church because you didn't keep all this stuff. That somehow you couldn't be a Christian because you didn't keep all this stuff. Anyone ever been there? Show your hands if you've ever been there. Encourage your people. There you go. Okay, and that is not true. The scriptures say that, that God showed his great love for you by sending his son to die for you while you were in the sewer of your sin. You don't need to clean up to get to him. He got you and reached down into your sewer and dragged you out. And that needs to be on our lips. And it also needs to be in our minds so that we never ever as a church, the Revolution Church never sets rules and laws on people that you have to live up to in order to come here. We can't do that. We have to be open to receive everybody. And so, if we're a new creation, 
If we're, if we're dead, like 2 Corinthians 5, 17, like I said it earlier, if anyone's in Christ, you're a new creation. The old has died, and behold, there's a new man. So this old man, that's kind of like the universal man. That's, the, that's ev- like everyone across the globe since way, 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 way back. They've all had their little gods that they worshipped, and, and, and they weren't real gods. And, but even us that have the real God, we, we still try to live up to all these standards. You know why? And it's not a good motivator. We're living in fear of our God. Like, that's us. We have the real God. But those that don't have the real God, they're still living in fear of their God in that they feel like they have to do something. They have to do all these things to make their God happy because they fear the punishment of their God. And, and, and Christians, we shouldn't live that way. That's not a good motivator. He motivates what? With love. For God so loved us that he sent his son. He showed his great love by sending his son to die while you're a sinner. So he's not requiring something of you for him to love you. So, so, so he, that's the old man. The old man that says, I have to live in fear of this God. I have to live in fear of the punishment of my God rather than living for my God. See the difference? We want to live for God. We don't want to live in fear of God and his wrath and his punishment. And there is consequence for our sin. Remember that. It's not a free pass to do what you want. He'll still love you if you commit the most heinous of crimes. He'll love you. But he may give you a little spanking. And ask you, let me fix those words. It's not may. It's coming. Because the Bible tells us that he spanks his kids that he loves. So if you ain't getting spanked, maybe you need to check and see if you're in the family. That's what happens. So see, the laws are just broad brush requirements that apply to all people. It's nothing really, it's nothing really personal. The law is good for everybody. It, it paints a broad brush of like, if you guys do this, you get along well. Everybody, but it's nothing personal. This is for everyone. But what God's looking for now, since Christ came, He's looking for something personal. He's looking for something with you. Not just a big book of rules that applies to every single person. They may be good, but let me tell you what great is. Great is is when you have a one-on-one pipeline, totally vertical with you and the Father. That's awesome. See, that's personal. That's personal. John the Baptist got this. When people were asking about him, he said, listen, I don't need more rules. We don't need more rules to live by. We don't need greater punishment for not, for not uh, obeying those rules. This is what we need. He said, he must increase and I must decrease. He didn't ask for more rules. He wanted Jesus to grow in him. He wanted Jesus to be famous and less of him. You know what he's saying? I gotta die. I gotta get out of the way so Jesus can truly be king. So putting me to death, putting I to death, means this. Not in fear of rules, not, thou shalt not commit adultery, or else. No, no. Maybe it's, it's different. See, we're supposed to be like Jesus. Would Jesus cheat on his spouse if he was married? No. See, see if we're to put us to death, that means that, that I'm not going to cheat on my spouse because it's wrong. It's just because I love them, and I know it's going to hurt her, or I know it's going to hurt him, and so I won't do that. It's not the, the common belief, which is, Man, if I get caught, that's going to cost me. You know what I'm saying? And I've mentioned this before. I'll say it again, like, just we all know, because not all of us are married, but it's the speeding thing. Like, all of us, including myself, I know you all make fun of me because I kind of drive like a grandpa, because I am one. (laughs) So quit making fun of me. I am a grandfather. Yeah, yeah, yes, new grandpa. Yeah. Yeah. How old are you? He's 50 years old. Last week, he changed his first diaper. (laughs) That was awesome, right? I don't know how you dodged that bullet that long. (laughs) I changed two duties today. I'm just saying. You got a lot of catching up to do, brother. (laughs) So, 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 so here's the, so do you speed? Do you not speed because you don't want to get caught? Love, that's not love. 
That's fear. That's self. I don't want to get caught because the cost would be high for me. But here's a, you know, the, the Bible says we're supposed to be changed the way we think, right? How about this? Just throwing it out there for you. I don't want to speed because I might hurt her. That little baby right there? That, that's love. So that's why Jesus wouldn't speed. He never speed. When the, someone was dying, he took his time. You know what I mean? I think Ken is probably the closest thing to Jesus we have. <laughs> Just easy going. <laughs> He had to be to have, a, to have 10 kids, right? You got to have some Jesus in you. Woo! It's like 11 with Michael, right? Hey, anyway, so, so, so instead of living for ourselves, instead of living in fear of, of the repercussions and the punishment, we're actually led by love. It's a little bit different, okay? Keeping the laws definitely don't equate to living for God by any means. See, living for God is a loving response it's, it's, it's an appreciation, it's gratitude, uh, and, and you love this God because this God loves you and the breath that you're bringing into your lungs right now is provided by him and the children you have are his gift to you and, and he came in, this, in the body of the son and he went to the cross to give you new life and so you love that Jesus so much that you live for him. It's a loving response to him rather than living in fear of penalty from him. That's not the way he wants us to live. Amen? Okay. You guys want to kill some more stuff? All right, let's, let's kill some more stuff. Here's, there's three things that condemn people and destroy us, okay? Three things. Uh, there's the enemy of our soul, just good old-fashioned Satan. This is the bad guy, okay? That's one. The, the second one is, is the world. And I don't mean chickadees and, bird and, 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 and oak trees. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay? You'll, you'll, I'll give you more. And then there's you. You condemn and destroy yourself too. Okay? And we'll go into details there in a minute. But the enemy, let's start with the first one. The enemy, the tempter, the accuser, the deceiver, the father of lies. These are all his titles. This describes who he is. He, he tempts us to sin because if we can sin, it will lead to destruction. The wages of sin, the payment for your sin is death. And if you don't literally die, you're going to at least get something bad. Like It's never good to sin. If you, uh, I listen to James McDonald all the time. He's got this famous saying. He says, if you choose to sin, you choose to suffer. That's, that's the way it's going to be. The Bible says certainly your sin will find you out. There's no hiding your porn addiction. It's coming out. Your wife's going to see it or your husband's going to see it. If you've been sneaking money out and buying weed and stuff, your spouse is going to find out and you need to confess before they do because there'll be more pain. So let's just get it out uh, at the beginning. So he tempts us to do things that are, uh, that are bad, and he's the father of lies. He says it's not bad if you just, I know you're married, but if you just, that, that girl right there, she's, it's okay, and, and, you're, and I want you to be, ha that's what everyone thinks, I want you to be happy, you should be happy, you know, it doesn't say that, no one has to be happy all the time, so you don't have to have her just because you want her, okay, so he deceives us, and he lies to us, and, and then he accuses us, he says, listen, you're no good, Jesus can't save you. You shouldn't even go to that church anymore. Those people don't really like you. They're all fake. They're, and he lies and he lies and he lies and he tells you that because of what I did in the garden, I, I snuck up on Adam and Eve. They weren't really paying attention. They weren't thinking. And I condemned you all forever. You're all going to hell. Let's see. We're going to kill some things, all right? You ready to kill some things? Go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. We're going to put an end to the, to the enemy's shenanigans right here, right now. You ready? Come on. Romans 6, 6. Tell me when you're there. Hey, Harry, would you do me a favor, brother? I love you, man. <clears throat> you ready? We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no, this is a good amen spot right here, you ready? We are no longer slaves to sin. Amen. 
For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also, this is Easter coming up, live. We will also live with him. So here, here's the thing. Two things happen here. One, he gives us, because the, the spirit that raised Christ to, from the dead now lives in you, he's given you some power, right? He can, he can raise from the dead, right? So that's some incredible power, and that power is now available to you. And so the, this, this temptation, this tempter comes to you, and he says, here, you should do this. It feels good. It looks good. Go get it. Now, before, like before you'd be like, yeah, I'm in. Now it's like, hell no. Right? No. You know why? I'm not cheating on my spouse because she's a gift from God and I don't even deserve her and you're so good to me. I want to lovingly respond to that goodness. No. She's, and this woman's not a piece of me. She's not there as an extension of my masturbation. She is my, she's a woman in the image of God and she deserves better than that and so does my wife. I'm not doing that. That's the difference. So there's that power inside of us now. The other thing is that when, when he condemned us all, the scriptures say in Romans 5, that because of the original sin of Adam, we're all condemned, every single one of us that walked the earth. But what this says here, right? You said amen to it. It says we are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. You know what the power of sin the power of sin is that power that sends you all to eternity in hell. That in Christ, when you died, when you went, when he went to the cross, you went with him when you bowed your knee. And now the grave no longer holds you. That sin is not going to end you. You will not die and go to hell. Christ has set you free from that. There's no more guilty verdict upon the, the group that is called Christians. You're going to live forever. For God so loved the world that he sent his son. So if you believe in him, you shall not perish, but have ever everlasting life. Amen. 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 Okay. So we've been crucified. Sin is no longer my end. Here's the second. I said the world, right? The world condemns and destroys. Go to 1 John chapter 2. <clears throat> you are? Did he just say I am God? Wow. That's bold, dude. 1 John chapter 2. The world condemns us. The world destroys us. And again, I'm not talking about oak trees and, and pretty bunny rabbits and all that kind of stuff. Let me tell you about, let me let's talk about the world. You guys ready there? 1 John chapter 2 verse 15. Y'all there? Christian likes it when you guys, if, if you like bite his cheeks and bury into his neck and go <laughs> like that, like he will laugh and he will make you laugh when you hear him laugh. It's hysterical. I would highly recommend it. He's quite yummy. <laughs> I have to be like, I tell you, you guys, this funny thing. Remember a couple weeks ago when I did that sermon on, on, on uh, racial reconciliation? I was talking a lot about black and white. He calls me the white guy now. <laughs> Do not leave your kids in this sanctuary. Okay, you ready? Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. <laughs> None of the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. So in other words, what he's saying is, it's almost like the first two are wrapped up in the third. He says, the physical pleasure, like this is gonna feel good, I wanna do this, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna get drunk, because I like getting drunk, and I feel good. It helps me escape reality, and it's just fun, right? Well, what it's saying here is um, there's that stuff, this physical pleasure and craving for the eyes. So like I said, like with the girl, you see a girl, she's hot. You want to just, you know, get with her and stuff because it's going to feel good. And then the third one is like all these things that I did and all the things that I wanted. Now look at, look what I got. Look, everybody, look what I got. And you get all prideful. Look at the notches in my bed, in my bedpost. Look at all the girls I've had. Look at all the money that I have. Look what I've got. And that's, the, that's what the world sa says to, to do, right? It's, it's all about you. Everything, you see it, you get it. That's what we're, that's, we're immersed in that culture, aren't, aren't we? 
Whatever you see, whatever you want, you just go after it. You get up and go and you get after that thing and you get it because it's what you want. It may not be what you need, but it's what you want. See, we live in that kind of world. Uh, I found a, an old video um, on YouTube. I want to show you this. And some of us old timers will remember this. And some of you young folks won't. Um, but this is a video from back in 1974. Okay? This is a video from back in 1974. And let me tell you something. It's, it's kind of funny. It's kind of lame. Because you can see how TV has changed over the years. This was like the height of technology and stuff. But this is what we're immersed in every single day that, that when you talk about the world tempting you to just go get what you want because it's all about you, you might not think of this when you're watching TV, but this is how you're being programmed. Take a look at this. Hello, Michael. Blair, hello, can you pay attention? Where's Michael? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I love this church. <laughs> he had to go pee. That is awesome. Oh, don't even play the video yet. Michael needs a public shunning. <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. Is this, is this even real? All right, turn it up. Volume. Someone, oh my heavens me, you've got to be kidding me. <sighs> of course it's not. Man, help Turn you, it, sir? just click it again, Lockers, double click it, please. Juniors and <sighs> okay, come here, guys, you got it, okay. Have it your way. Two Whoppers, two Whopper Juniors, and four Coca-Cola. And would I have to wait long if you made one Whopper with no pickle and no lettuce? No, sir. Hold the pickle, hold the lettuce. Special orders don't upset us. All we ask is that you let us serve it your way. Candy, I think I saw you wearing oh, that hat once. In that case, could I have Isn't the true? other Whopper with... See you with that hat on one day? Sure. <laughs> we can serve your rosy <laughs> Whopper fresh with everything on top of any way you think. Now that's the way to do things, our way. Have it your way. Have See, you're being programmed, you know? You think it's like this cute little, catchy little tune and stuff, but you're being programmed to have it your way. Who wants to punch the lady behind the counter in the throat? Like, totally annoying, right? Can you imagine going to Burger King and she just starts singing to you? That would be awesome. You know what else I loved? I lo Did you see me at the beginning when they were like running into the restaurant? Like Burger King was the greatest thing. They're like get, and they're pushing people out of the way and stuff. Now it's like, oh crap, I got to go to Burger King. I got no more money. You know? <laughs> it's funny. It's funny. But anyway, we were, we're programmed that way. You know that, that you can find, if you go to YouTube, they have modern day commercials for Burger King with that same catchphrase. They're still pushing that down your throat. Do you remember Toyota? What was it? Uh, we do it all for you. Everything is about you. Everything is about you. See something, you like it, I have to have it. And then look, everybody, look what I got. That's what the world offers you. But let me tell you something. Look what it says. These things are not from the Father. And this world is fading away along with everything. Hey, Michael's back. Yeah, all right. Maybe go pee pee before service. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I love Revolution Church. Oh my God. We, you know, we should have a blooper reel here. Um, so anyway, it says, it says um, this world is fading away with every, along with everything that people crave. Do you, know, do you ever notice that, 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 that after, if you're back in the day when you're a cheating lying guy, do you remember that one girl, like you got her and then you needed another one? It wasn't enough. You know why? Because it's fading. You know when you buy a brand new car, you know why you need to go buy another one five years later? Because that one's fading. No. Because it just doesn't really mean anything anymore. See, you need to have it, and then it just doesn't mean anymore. The, the novelty wears off. The things of this world, they, they wear off. 
They're fading, and, and so that's not where we should put our trust. We need to, we need to kill some stuff, okay? Let's, let's, kill, let's kill something else. Go back to Galatians chapter 6. The world is offering you things that will not satisfy you, and so this craving that you have, and just because you satisfy, that doesn't mean you're going to have eternal peace and eternal joy and contentment because things fade. The, the, the flash fades and the, gl and the glitter, sorry Candy, the, the glitter fades and, and eventually you need to get some more glitter, right? You can't just, you, you always got to get more glitter because a little glitter doesn't cut it. You got to have some more glitter. So, so, so let's read here, okay? Um, Galatians 6.14. Galatians 6, 14, we're going to kill something. Galatians 6, 14 says this. As for me, Paul says, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's saying like all this stuff that, that the world says that I need and then I, I gather it because it makes me happy. And, 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 and look, everyone, look at what I have. Look at all my stuff. Look at my position. Look at my power. Look at my wealth. Look at my house. Look at my, my, my this and look at my that. And aren't you so proud of me? And, and what is it saying here? It says in, in Galatians 6, 14 that I, I should never boast about those things. That the only thing I should boast about is the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know why? Because that's the only place where you find eternal joy. And that's the only place you find eternal uh, contentment. And the only place you find eternal peace is right there at the cross of Jesus Christ. Because, uh, because of the cross, my interest in this world has been crucified. Because now my attention, and the only thing I want to boast about is my Lord Jesus. Like, I don't want to boast about anything else. I just want to boast about Him. He is the one thing that I've received that I can boast about that's amazing, that actually fills the voids of my life and gives me purpose and, and, and gives me fulfillment. This is the only thing that works. The other stuff doesn't work. It never satisfies and so when we, when we come to Christ, we want to crucify the desires of the world. We want to kill those things. We don't want those things anymore, okay? Now here, here's the, so the first one's the enemy. The second one is, is the world. Here's the, the, the third one. And, and, and you know, uh, you, you put on Facebook and, and you see, um, you know, like uh, boyfriends and girls, friends and, and husbands and wives, they're splitting up all the time and, and that's bad. And, 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 and you know, you, you look and you see uh, that these, that they get, someone posts that, you know, I'm broken up with him and she's broken up with me and da da da. And what do you see? You see all the time people with, pardon me, with good intentions, they come on onto that strand and they're like, well, you know what? You just, you just need to follow your heart. You know, you just need to follow your heart. You ever hear people say that? You know, the book that we call Truth says that the heart is deceitful and wicked above all all things. There's nothing good about the human heart. Nothing. And so when I say that you have to die, you need to get rid of this heart and let God give you a new heart. Because your heart is wicked. And Paul can't even trust his own heart. And he's the guy who wrote half the, the New Testament. He's like, I have to test myself sometimes because I'm not even sure if my heart's leading me the right way. Our heart is deceitful and wicked above all things. As a matter of fact, we see what comes out of our heart that condemns us and destroys us. Matthew 15, 19. Go to the first gospel. Matthew 15, 19. This is, this is what Jesus Christ says about the heart. This is what Jesus Christ says about following your heart. Just do, just do what your heart tells you. Follow your heart. Listen to your heart. When it's calling to you, listen to your heart. Nothing else you can do. I don't know where. I'm. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> 19. For from the heart, this is the heart you're supposed to listen to, right? Uh, for from the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. These are what defile you. Should we listen to the heart? Who said yes? <laughs> They're all pointing you. You're all lying. Mandy slapped them all. Okay? Look, you wanna, you, that's not bad enough, right? Let me give you some more. Galatians 5.19. We're in Galatians a lot. Galatians 5.19. You ready? Tell me when you're there. 
When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, yeah, follow your heart. Here we go. You ready? The results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Listen to your heart when it's calling to you. It's telling you to go be bad. Nothing good comes from out of there. Nothing good comes from out of there. But, I like buts, right? 524 says something different. But those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have what? Nailed, nailed their passions. 519, 524, I'm sorry. Nailed their passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. We've crucified them there, okay? We've crucified them there. Maybe, maybe it looks like this. I don't want to look at porn anymore. I don't want to look at porn anymore. I choose to not look at porn anymore because it's not God's best. Because she's not a piece of meat, this woman on the, on the screen. Or for the ladies that look at it, that guy's not a piece of meat. He's a, a man or a woman made in the image of God to be like him. He's got value. He's got worth. He's not an extension of your masturbation. That's not who he or she is. Do you see? Maybe you don't look at it because you don't want to devalue your spouse. Maybe you don't want to put false, uh, false, false uh, levels of expectation on your spouse. And so we don't want to look at these things anymore. It's not best for me. I love my spouse. And, and that little girl on the TV is someone's little girl of value. And so out of love, I don't do those things. I'm going to crucify that on the cross. I'm going to put it to death. Maybe it looks like this. Maybe it's choosing to stop buying a bunch of stuff on credit that you can't afford so that you're no longer a slave to Visa. Maybe you just decide that I don't need that stuff. Maybe I just don't need it as much as I think I do. God wants me to be free. I don't need it. I want to have one slave and one motivator. His name is Jesus. I want to, I mean, I want to, be, I want to be the slave of one. I don't want to choose to, be, to, to obey this other master called Visa or MasterCard. If I can't afford it, I don't buy it. He doesn't want us in chains anymore. He wants you free. Listen. How can you give freely and, and sow seeds into the kingdom so people can get saved and hear the good news of the gospel when every dollar that you make can't go into an offering plate? It has to go to the minimum payment of your visa card. So he wants to free you so you can be generous because Christians are supposed to be generous, but that thing doesn't change right at the altar. It's a choice that you make to crucify the sinful nature and not overspend so you can be free to give generously. That's what he wants for you, okay? Crucifying my sinful nature might also look like these things. I don't have to have my way all the time. I'm guilty. Am I the only one here? There's seven, can you, I was thinking about this today as I was getting ready to come up here. There are seven billion people on this earth. What's the chances of me being right about anything? Seriously. Like, don't be making fun of me now. You're supposed to have a mirror in front of your face. Don't be looking at me. I know I'm wrong a lot. But this is about y'all now, too. I mean, to think, think about it for a second, to think that I have the answer. Me, one man out of seven billion, I, got, I know the answer. You're all wrong except me. So maybe, it's, maybe you just laid, laid down that feeling and say, you know, maybe I don't have to be right all the time. Maybe I can check my pride at the door before I come home. You know, I'm stealing this from a buddy. He told me this, and I agree, it's perfect. I know there's a God and I ain't him. You want to repeat that? I know there's a God and I ain't him. You know, there's only one that's right all the time. Maybe 
crucifying my sinful self, laying down my life, letting myself die means, yeah, I'm tired. I worked, but I choose to, you know what, get down on the floor and play with you, my sweetheart, and we'll play Barbie dolls. You know, I'm tired, but, you know, if you want to play, you know, let's just play. Maybe I don't need to, my own sinful self is thinking about me all the time, and I worked, and so I get home, and I just want to relax. But, 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 but mom has been with the kids all day, and the kids want to see daddy, and they just want to play with you, and so when you come home exhausted, maybe you just go, you know what, I choose, even though I'm exhausted, to get down on the floor and play with you. Maybe dying to ourself, maybe crucifying ourself means that I'm going to, to submit to my husband in all things. Maybe that's what it looks like. I choose to submit to my husband in all things. Or maybe it's I choose to love my wife and consciously, look, and we've talked about this before and I'm working on this too, day in, day out, going back to the cross and picking my clothes up off the floor. <laughs> because somewhere along the line, I subconsciously made a choice that, listen up, that I made a choice that my wife was my slave. And so I just come home and, and, and just, and you know, so, so, so I have to make a choice. So maybe dying to my sinful self means I have to make a choice today and then again tomorrow and then again the next day to not throw my crap all over the floor for the slave. That maybe I think of her as more important than that. And you know, the Bible doesn't have a, a commandment about the clothes on the floor. Did you know that? It doesn't have a commandment. It doesn't have a law about being tired and deciding that you're gonna come home and play with your kids on the floor and, and to come to your end and just do that for them. Like, it, there's no commandment specifically about that. This is what living by the Spirit of God means. There's no commandment, but if we will acknowledge Him in all of our decisions and ways, He will direct our steps. And that's a relationship with God, not through keeping rules, but by letting the Spirit lead you. Look in Romans, uh, Galatians 5.25, where we were just reading. We read 24. Since, it says here, um, We've, we've crucified these desires on the cross, these passions and desires of our sinful nature. So since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our life. So, so that's what I'm talking about. It's not just a bunch of broad brush rules that you just have to keep that are universal for all people, but following His Spirit in the specifics of your life. There's no rule that says get on the floor after work and play with your little girl. But the spirit that leads you in love says play with your little girl because they need their daddy. Play with your little boy because he needs his daddy. Like that's what the spirit of God will do. That's living by the spirit. That's what it looks like. And these aren't laws. They're leadings of love. And that's why he says let that spirit lead you in every part of your life. Let me ask you a question. How many people have been in a car accident while driving in their life? Most of us. Let me ask you this. If you somehow could, somehow could see for miles to your left, see for miles in front of you, and see for miles to your right, if you could do that, if you had the ability to do that, would you agree, show of hands, that you'd get in less car accidents? So if you knew what was coming your way, you'd get in less car accidents, right? Let God lead you, because he can. He can see that. And so if you'll, let him, if you'll let him lead every area of your life, you'll avoid the accidents, you'll avoid the fender benders, and you'll avoid the major catastrophes of life. It, this looks, so dying to yourself means literally, Jesus, bro, here's the reins of my life. You know, the Jesus take the wheel thing. That's what it is, here, you, you, you lead. And, and I'm not just going to try to keep a bunch of rules. I'm not just going to show up at church and give my, 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 my obligatory five bucks. I'm going to actually pray. I'm going to talk to you, and I'm going to hear from you, and I'm, and I'm going to let you lead me so that, it, that if I acknowledge you in all things, you'll direct my steps. Something was coming, you know? 
That's what he's looking for. That's a real relationship with Jesus. In the scriptures, twice it says that there's a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to death. And so he wants us to give up the reins of our life to him. Um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there's four gospels. Three, they had a lot of stuff to choose from. I think it was John that said, I didn't write everything about Jesus while I was there with him because it would take me forever and a day in this book. You'd have to fill up 100 books. Right? I only chose a couple of things here that I share with you. But, but, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all, of all the, the smorgasbord of awesomeness that was in front of them with Jesus, they chose, all three of them, somehow decided that they were going to all mention that if you hang on to your life, you lose it. But if you give up your life, you save it. You save your life. Give up my life, my way, my agenda, my plan, my goals, my style, my elevation, my promotion, my provision. The default of the human heart is my, my, my. And my and I have to die. We have to die. And listen, just don't think that this is just for the spiritual elite. Because Paul, who's spiritually elite, if you will, it's not just for him. It's not just for the seminary graduates. It's not just for the pastors and the, and the Billy Grahams. Okay? Some might think that, well, it comes easy for, for you to, to, to crucify your sinful natures and, and, and passions to the cross and, and play with your little kid, but it's not easy for me. It's not for everybody. Is that true? Well, let, let's kind of land in this last spot for the night and let's get answers to that. Is it for the spiritual elite? Is it for some but not for others? Go to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, Paul's writing again. And this is what he says in Philippians 3.10. We'll read a few verses. He says this. I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. And experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death. So that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed, and this is a big word, me. <laughs> no, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on on this one thing forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead I press on some translation will say I strive I strive I strain I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, not me, is calling us. See, Paul acknowledges that there's an upward call in his life, but he also says it's not just on this spiritual elite group, the guys who write the Bible, but it's this heavenly call that's on all of us. It's on me and it's on you. It's on every single person. What Christ went to the cross for, why he went and got crucified, is so that all people, all people, all seven billion of you, would come to him and receive that prize that he's, that he's calling you to. It's for everybody. What's for everybody? Listen to, listen to what Paul says. He says, I want to know Christ. I want to know. I don't know about you. But if you spend time in the Bible, you can actually get a relationship kind of with the writers. And when, you, when they write, you can almost sense the yearnings of their heart. 
Do you know what I mean? Like when you spend a lot of time with someone, you can kind of, you, you, you pick up on stuff that's more than just type. And, and when I read this, I like, man, I want to know Christ. I want to know, he knew Christ. But he even says, I want to know, I want deeper. I want to know him. I, I wrote down the three most famous people that I have met in my life. Okay. First one's Jack Nicholas. Y'all know who Jack Nicholas is? The golfer? The greatest golfer that has ever lived. Bar none. He has won 73 times on the PGA Tour. And he's won 18 majors. Majors are like, you know, the, the Masters, the U.S. Open, the British Open, the PGA Championship. These are the biggest, best in the world. And he's won it 18 times. And so I'm at a golf course one day. It's a qualifying tournament for the PGA Tour. And his son, who was a good little player too, he's trying to make it out there on the tour that dad was on. And, and, I'm, and I'm watching, and there's this guy walking along the wood line. And I'm like, and there was like nobody there because this is not a big famous tournament. These are the people trying to be good, you know? And I look over, I'm like, no way. I got to meet, I, just, I had to meet. This. I was in the golf business. He was the man, you know, he's... He's the man. So I walk over there and I, I was Jack Nicholas, you know, and I shook his hand and he's like, I, I'm Jack. <laughs> I'm Jack, really? You know, so I met him. The second one was John Kerry. Y'all know who John Kerry is? Secretary of State of the United States of America. So when he was the Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts, my father was involved with this thing and, and so I, I went with my dad into the office with his boss, which was Mike Dukakis, who was our governor. And, and, and John Kerry was his lieutenant governor. And I got to be in there and I shook his hand and all that. You know, that's pretty cool. And then the third is Joel Osteen. Everyone know who Joel Osteen is? So I, got, I met him at a book signing. He was signing his book. And he's just as friendly and happy in person as he is on TV. You know, I was like, man, I'm, I, I'm, thank you for your lessons. They've really helped me. This is when I first got saved, you know. And he just looked at me all gentle. And he's like, well, I'm sure glad I could help. <laughs> he's like, that's the way he really is. It's obnoxious. So, but here's the thing. There's a massive difference. Like, I can't, I can't just pick up the phone and call, hey, Jack, you want to go play? Hey, you know, uh, uh, Senator Kerry, uh, you know what? Like, I don't have a cell phone number. I can't just call up, and hey, you know what? This whole Iraq thing, you guys got it all wrong. Let me, let me tell you what you should be doing. I don't, like, he and I, we're not homies. You know what I'm saying? We're not buddies. So there's a massive difference between knowing of and knowing about. That's not the same as knowing. To know him. To, to, to talk to him. This is what Paul's saying. He's like, to talk to Jesus. Not just follow a bunch of rules, but to talk to Jesus. And to, and to listen when he talks to you. To experience his power. He says, I want to experience the power that raised Christ. And that he, I, I want to experience when Jesus invades my life and changes it. Anyone have those surprise checks that come? And Kelly was stressing out about going up to see the baby. And all of a sudden his boss says, yeah, you're new, but we'll give you, uh, we'll give you a vacation early and we'll pay you for it. Now, maybe we were saying like, that, that's what I'm talking about, right? Like, I want to experience that stuff, right? I want to experience when this, this Jesus who claims power and authority, when he invades my world and, and does something. I want to experience that. I want to I rejoice in his creation. I want to go outside and just be in awe of what he's done. And that I have the eyes, been gifted with eyes to see it and ears to hear it. And I want to rejoice in his creation and delight in his unexpected provision. Do you want to know who knows Jack Nicholas? I don't know Jack Nicholas. I know of him. I can go online and tell you how many majors he won and how many tournaments he won. And I shook his hand. But do I know him? You know who knows him? His caddy. It's true. You know why? Because he walks with me and he talks with me. Because when Jack Nicholas is on the golf course, here's his faithful caddy alongside of him, talking to him, talking about the shot. What club should I hit? What about the wind? What's my lie look like? What do you think I should do here? 
And when he hits a good shot, what does he do? He rejoices with Jack. And when he hits a bad shot, what does he do? He grieves with Jack. And when he wins the tournament, he celebrates with Jack. And when he loses in sudden death, he grieves with Jack. Every single win, every single loss, every situation that Jack Nicholas is in, his caddy is right there with him. He knows Jack Nicholas. And so that's why Paul says here in, in verse 10 and 11 of Philippians chapter 3, he says, I want to suffer with him and share in his death. Why? Why does he want to go through these experiences with Jesus? So like the caddy, we can enjoy the win. Do you know what I'm saying? So we can enjoy the experience when God invades your world and participates in your every action and thought. When he invades your world and changes your circumstances and gives you the provision I want to experience the win with him, so I want to walk with him closely. And, and last, but definitely not least, is this, and it's in that text, and that is that this thing is going to be rough. It's not going to be easy. It's no walk in the park. Killing yourself is not easy at all. So if we're to enjoy this abundant life, this new abundant life, you've got to do two things. And he says right there in the text, in verse 13, he says, forgetting the past. We have to forget the past. If you're a Christian, if you're in Christ, the old has died, behold the new man. So look at me, all of you that are fading fast. Your past sins do not define you. That is not who you are anymore. It doesn't matter how grievous and ugly. Jesus' blood covers it all. It's not who you are anymore. 1 John 1, 9 tells us that if we confess our sins, so if we come to Christ, if we're in Christ, we're a new creation, we confess our sin to Jesus, we give our life to Jesus, and what it says in 1 John 1, 9 is if you confess your sin to him, he is faithful to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you. In other words... All that old stuff, gone. Washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Washed. And the last thing is that, it's from the King James, he doesn't press forward. He stra you have to strain forward to what lies ahead. Strained shouldn't be blown off like it's no big thing. Strained is to force yourself to make a strenuous or unusually great effort. You have to forget the past and you have to strain for, you must make yourself, you have to beat your body and your thoughts into submission every day and strain forward. It's not going to be easy. You have to push yourself to do this great thing. Like a runner at the end of the race. You ever see them when they come to the end of the race? They're straining forward like this to get the very best that they can. And that's what we need to do. We need to put our past behind us and we have to allow other people to put their past behind them and don't hold them to it anymore. If Jesus Christ's blood was enough to wash your sin, then it's certainly enough to wash your sin and your sin and everyone's sin in this room and everyone's sin in this city and across the globe. So, if you will choose to put I to death by letting go of laws, and letting God lead in specifics. If you will choose to put I to death by not being led by sinful desires served up by the world, served up by your own sinful heart and by the devil himself, but instead let the Spirit lead you in all things. And if you endeavor to really know Jesus, to really know Jesus personally, not some rules that are universal for all people, but if you'll 
personally endeavor to know Jesus and, and persevere by straining forward and make, making the commitment. Finally, I see it too often. People come to the, to the cross, they get baptized, and then they, they fade. Listen, brothers and sisters. Strain forward. Work at this thing. Beat your body into submission and make yourself go to your knees and make yourself pick up your Bible and read and make yourself give and make yourself serve and love. you got to make yourself do it. And if you'll do that, you can enjoy this abundant life that he promised you. And you can truly say that I no longer live but Christ lives in me. And listen, none of these verses that I shared with you, none of them say that I was killed with Christ. What it said was, listen, it said crucified with Christ, right? Right? Crucified with Christ. Crucifying someone is a process of death. It was used because it's long and painful. And so dying to yourself is not, not just happen at the moment you give your life to Christ at the altar. It's a process of death. It's a daily death. It's a daily choice to lay down your sinful nature and let Him have the control of your life. Amen? Do me a favor. Would you stand, everybody? I want you to do me a favor. If, if you have not, if you have not yet reached perfection, like Paul said, that there's, there's things inside of you that are still yet sinful, that you need to crucify them. Raise your hand. Everyone, 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 everyone. Do me a favor. Before we sing this song, keep playing, guys. Everyone in here raised their hand, didn't you? Put someone else's hand in yours, both sides. Let's pray together. We all need to do this. It's all right. He got you. Don't be alone. Don't be alone. All of us need the work of God in us. All of us need the power of the Holy Spirit in us. Lord, I thank you for this word. I thank you for, for, for being straightforward with us all the time. Lord, there's, every single person in this room has confessed to you that there are areas of our life that have not yet been given over to you. That there's sin nature inside of us still that needs to die. You said that you came that we would have life and have it to the full. And that the only way we're going to do that is we become like you. That we would actually no longer live. We would come to the end of ourselves. We would no longer live but that Christ, that you would live through us. And that is what we're asking you to do right now. Surgery on our soul. Surgery on our sinful heart. Surgery on our mind that thinks wrong. Help us to think rightly about who you are, rightly about who we are in you, and help us to daily strive forward. Help us to forget the past and move forward to receive the prize that we've been called to. Work in us now, Lord. And I'm going to take a moment, just keep your hands together, and privately let God work in that area. He is relentless and he's coming after you now, right now. godly sorrow that leads to repentance that's what he's looking for he's not looking for you to feel horrible about yourself and what you've done he's looking for you to have godly sorrow that leads you to change and do it his way godly sorrow that leads to repentance God loves you God loves you God loves you 
God loves you. His heart is that you be like his son. Let the Holy Spirit lead you in all the areas of your life. Not broad brush rules, but led in love and the specifics. We're going to forego communion and we're going to sing to Jesus right now. We're going to let him relentlessly pursue. We're going to rejo- Let's sing to him now and rejoice in the fact that he's relentlessly pursuing the dark nooks and crannies of your heart right now. So just sing to him. Sing with him. Man, sing, 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 sing.
Jesus. 